Okay. Might clean it up, you guys. Yes. <laughs> so Dr. Pierce will be presenting a Fulbright in Bosnia and Herzegovina. She was raised, born and raised in Charlotte and lives permanently in Western North Carolina, where she works with the Guardian Ad Litem program of the 24th Judicial District, advocating for foster children in the family court system. She is currently the 2020-2023 Fulbright Scholar to Bosnia and Herzegovina and is on the current Fulbright Specialist roster with a specialty in child protection and refugees health, refugee health. Dr. Pierce received her bachelor's from Syracuse yeah. University in journalism. She earned her master's in cultural geography at, the, at UNC Chapel Hill and her doctorate in medical geography also at UNC Chapel Hill, where she developed a working predictive model of the relationship between refu refugees, migration, and health. Dr. Pierce began her professional life as a Peace Corps volunteer in Western Samoa and later worked for United States Catholic Conference as director of the Refugee Resettlement Program, a USCS affiliate in Charlotte. In 1993, she founded International Health and Human Services, a walk-in clinic for uninsured refugees and immigrants before re-entering academic life. After receiving her doctorate, she began working overseas First as a Soros Foundation visiting lecturer in Armenia. She was later county director for the USAID food program in Kigoma, Tanzania, benefiting AIDS ravished families and local school children. She served as a senior specialist for the Global Disaster Response Division of Habitat for Humanity in Bangkok, Thailand, and between 2010 and 2015, worked as a volunteer for the Burma Medical Association in my sought Thailand. Her current research and field work in Bosnia and Herzegovina is focused on the development of civil society and the role of community-based organization, organizations in the generation of post-war social fabric of BIH. So I now present to you Dr. Margaret Pierce. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. I this opportunity is for me a great one because I know I have a whole table full of people who are interested in the subject that I'm talking about. Uh, and in general, when you do these Fulbrights, you do anything overseas, you get your 15 minutes of fame, then you come home. And a week later, people are rolling their eyes when you're, you know, telling them about your experience. So I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you together tonight and also you know maybe to generate some some ideas um, based on sort of a compare and contrast situation with the United States some of maybe some of the stereotypes we have about Herze Bosnia Herzegovina um, the situation how it's like the United States how it's not like the United States uh, and the relationship between the country and uh, the United States. But the first thing that I would like to do, because I think it really sums up my position and my feelings about the six months, actually nine months that I spent in Bosnia as a, as a Fulbright scholar, it, it sums up what in my heart I believe to be the takeaway from my experience in this country. And, and, and in my mind, it's the message that I actually wrote for Senator Tom Tillis, who was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, no longer. But he has been to Bosnia. He is an advocate for Bosnia. He'll be in a position to um, to referee on stuff that's coming up. And I wrote this letter to him when I returned. And I actually feel it very strongly uh, and still believe in it. So um, my I take off the first part, but it was basically, dear, dear Tom, <laughs> uh, dear Senator Tillis. Um, and uh, after the usual introductions of who I was and what I had been doing, um, I wrote, 
As a Fulbright Scholar for the 2022-23 year, I had the opportunity to immerse myself in the daily life of the country and to witness firsthand the challenges that ordinary men and women face at the local level. In Zenesa, I found a community collectively trying to keep its head above water in spite of government corruption and attempts to divide them politically. They deserve better. I was surprised to learn that the people that I worked with on a daily basis did not divide themselves along ethnic lines that I, as I had been led to believe. Instead, I found the opposite to be true. My friends and colleagues did not identify or congregate along those ethnic lines and went to great lengths not to identify or segregate themselves as such. They saw themselves proudly as Bosnians, not as Bosniaks, not as Croats, Serbs, or others. My friends and colleagues were respectful of differences among themselves, were often of mixed heritage, and resented the efforts of politicians to divide them by ethnicity for the sake of personal political power. I also came to realize that most Bosnians I interacted with believe that the country's political and governance system based on ethnic power sharing as created by the Dayton Accords of 1995 has resulted in a quagmire of governance that does not reflect or respect the beliefs or needs of ordinary citizens. Divides them unwillingly and unnecessarily and benefits only the corrupt, corrupt power brokers. I found the level of cynicism, discouragement, and lack of hope for the future to be alarming, but not surprising, surprising given everything that Bosnia's citizens have been forced to endure as a result of political disrespect and exploitation by their own leaders. But what I also found encouraging was the unshakable gratitude and respect that ordinary citizens have for America's role in ending the 1992-1995 war. America's role model as a functioning democracy and for America's continuing support of political and governance reforms. They made me proud of my country in the respect they showed for our institutions and for the faith they have that America will continue to advocate for democratic reforms that respect and benefit the individual and the human rights of all. They appreciate our diplomatic presence and support our efforts to make Bosnia a sovereign nation. They vocally respect our ambassador and support his efforts to combat corruption and to avoid further division of the country. As a native, as an American and a native North Carolinian, I am proud of our efforts and advocacy, and I'm proud of your efforts and advocacy on behalf of the citizens of Bosnia, Herzegovina, and sincerely hope that you will continue your active support going forward. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to take 20 minutes and we're going to do letters, but I just kind of wanted to know where you I was coming from in the six months. And also to point out that, man, didn't some South Assassin sound familiar? Really? You know? Didn't it sound familiar? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and here you have a country that is ethnically divided and doing everything that it can to to on a personal level, on a day-to-day -day level, on a community level, for people not to show their hands as, as to what ethnic group they've been shoved into, but to get along on a personal level. And here, what are we doing? <laughs> We're taking every opportunity we can to prove how different we are from our neighbors. Now, these are people that went through a war and a genocide as a result of having that attitude. And so what I say to my American friends is, we cannot let people divide us. Because in Bosnia, you have a perfect example of what happens when people allow themselves to be labeled and then turned against people who have allowed themselves to be labeled in a different way. 
So that's that that's my takeaway. And I'm really I really enjoyed my time. And there there are a couple of other things that I wanted to talk about because I could talk all day on this. But the Fulbright program, anybody here been a Fulbright? Uh I recommend it. <laughs> I totally recommend it. In fact, I'm gonna tell a tale of myself, two stories. One, uh Brief explanation. The Fulbright Award is a award that's given by the U.S. Department of State uh, to people who, number one, have had a significant influence in their communities, right? And number two, want the opportunity to go over and do cross-cultural studies with another country about a specific topic at the same time, they represent the United States and represent an opportunity for technical exchange and knowledge transfer and cultural exchange, right? So if you think about what the aim of the American government is in other countries, it's for other countries to actually, number one, like the United States, and number two, do what we say. Uh, and so the best way to do that is as we know, familiarity, you know, you, you, once you you meet up with somebody and exchange ideas, you've born, you, you have a relationship. And it's the citizen's diplomacy is what they call it. So in the Fulbright program that I was in, Fulbright covers everything. You, anybody from any walk of life can get a Fulbright. It just takes a lot of time to do the paperwork. But in the uh, in the Fulbright Scholar Program, when I went over there, I had a friend already, and and people would say, "What are you doing here? What are you doing here?" And I would try to explain what I was doing there, and their eyes would glaze over. And from, finally, my friend said, "She's on vacation." <laughs> <laughs> they go, "Oh, okay, <laughs> she's on vacation," because actually, it's very hard to describe the re the the, luck, the sheer luck that you would have by being given an opportunity by the American government to go spend some six months somewhere just to learn about them, you know, and you got a good idea. Uh, so that is what the Fulbright is actually an award. You got a good idea, you got credentials, you write a good application, you get to go anywhere you want. So uh, my autobiography is going to read, a funny thing happened on the way to Burma. Because I, <laughs> for those of you who are old enough to remember that movie, because I was actually headed to Burma because all my work has always been done in Southeast Asia, refugees. Really, yeah. Burma? Oh, well, the Thai, Bur, <laughs> Burma Thai border, right? Yeah. Uh, so lately, so I, I, you know, had a great little project and everybody's going to fund it. Oh, that sounds great. Margaret's going to Burma. And, uh, and then all of a sudden there was a military coup. And that, that idea was dead. Uh, as as my neighbor said, that dog weren't going to hunt. <laughs> so, and then a friend of mine who knew a friend of mine said, you know, you ought to consider Burma. I mean, you ought to consider, consider Bosnia. And I said, well, you know, it's interesting because the subject of my my research is because I work in child protection and in courts, is like, what is it about a community that holds it a, together uh, that is the network that where it can take care of its own children? Because I don't know if any of you guys know, but I've worked in foster care in the courts for eight years, and we have a serious, serious problem of kids coming into care because of abuse, neglect, and dependency. So the question from my mind was, okay, here you have Bosnia, which has a very strong extended family system, which is able to absorb children, war children, you know, from the war, orphans, et cetera, like that. You know, how how does that look? Because here we got a drug epidemic. 100% of the kids that I've represented in eight years have been in care because not because of poverty, <laughs> drug abuse, right? They don't have that in Europe. So I was trying to look at what is their community, you know, looks like and, and how do you, because the question is, how do you have a strong community fabric that is able to absorb children in families that, that the family is not strong and needs help, right? 
And so I get over there and the, uh, and of course, you know, it's never what you think. And then I began to talk to people about it, thinking, oh, this is very strong extended family. And I came to find out that their families were less strong than our families because they have this huge out migration of young people, which is just tearing the fabric of their communities apart. So here you have, like, I, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, and I'm conducting the interviews with these women. I'm going, both your sons went to Germany? And she said, yeah. And I go, I don't, you know, I, I'm a mother, you're a mother. How was that? Yeah, I, you know, took him to the bus station. And the reality is that here you have a country, like I described, that's unworkable. Right. And then you have all these these generations of children who are graduating from college. Like in India. Right. No jobs. Not only no jobs, but they feel so disrespected by the politicians that want them to to only, you know, be part of one identity politics or another that you hear them say over and over again it, that I feel disrespected by my own country because it's just a gridlock. Uh, I have three degrees. I speak four languages and I can't get a job. I'm working at the grocer, right? Germany is buying our bus tickets because Germany is faced with the labor shortage. So all these mothers are putting their kids on buses to go to Germany and I said, I'm sorry, there's no way that you put your kid on the bus to go to Germany and come home and didn't cry about it, you know? And that's when they break down. And that's when they say things like, I know they have to go. I know our country can't take care of them. I know they don't feel like they're part of this country. I know that the politicians think if they just get rid of them, there's no, there's no group there to ask questions. I know that I want them to go, but yes, as a mother, and this one woman said to me, I said, what's the thing that bothers you the most? And she said that I will never get to walk my grandchildren to school like my grandmother walked me. It was like, I just boohooing, right? We were both boohooing. Because the reality is that unless you have a strong unless people feel connected to their country and, and you know it's, it, you have to have a small strong connection to your community to actually take that kind of abuse in a situation that's a political situation that's not really of your making or you leave so out migration in that part of the serbia croatia Bosnia, that whole part of the world those people are fle are moving those young people are moving uh, to the west for all those open jobs in in austria or germany or whatever so that's very that's very interesting um and the other thing that i wanted to say about this place was um it is it's eastern europe uh and you know their central europe is a sort of a, a made-up term but this is eastern europe it's a piece of geography, it's a piece of territory that has been fought over by everyone. It is a victim of geography. It sits right there, been invaded and conquered by the Turks. Austro and Hungarian Empire came down and, and got it. You know, the Russians are looking at it. And it's just this, it's a piece of geography that is by its location always gonna be fought over. Uh, and it's a, a location where in all of these movements of populations and rulers, you have a huge Islamic pro uh, presence, right, from the Ottoman Empire being there as long as it was. And you have a, a huge, you have a Serb population, biggest population, part of the population is, uh, is what they call Bosniaks, which are Muslims. And you have uh, the, you have Serbians. That's an ethnic group. And then you have Croats. So those are the three large groups. But then you have all these others, right? They don't get to vote. You have to be part of a certain power brokering ethnic group 
to be able to participate. And so it's a parliamentary constituent democracy, which means basically it's it you vote for your party. The party puts in who they want, right? You're not voting for the individual. So it makes it very hard to do uh, sort of reformist politics. And the parties themselves have a, a, um, a very tight grip on their party members. So they're not, a, there's not a lot of reform going on. Uh, but it's a system we set up, right? And then, you know, if you're reading the news these days, this guy Dodic from Republic of Serbska is just about to clear, you know, to exit from Bosnia. So it's it really is a tinderbox, and it's a very unfortunate situation. Meanwhile, you have this whole country full of people just trying to get along, right? And people ask me, what is you know, what is you didn't learn about Bosnia that you wish you had learned? And I go, you know, the thing that I didn't learn about Bosnia is I wish I could have learned more about people's religion, but they're so bent on not throwing that out there that I couldn't to tell who's Muslim. I couldn't tell who was Serbian Orthodox. I couldn't tell who was Croatian Catholic. I'm sorry. I, I think I said that wrong. It's the Bosniaks, the Catholics, and the Orthodox is the three groups. You can't tell who's who because they know the cost and the ultimate price you pay for identity politics. But at the national level and the international level, it's just turned there. It's going on as, as fast as it can. Uh, so how does the United States fit into it? United States is absolutely the savior of this country in their eyes in 1995 because it stopped the war, right? He stopped the genocide. But the United that was 1995, right? This is not the and I, I I do in conversations with my friends say this is not the America of 1995. Since 1995, we've gone through a number of things, you know, 9/11. Uh, we've gone through COVID. We've gone through a recession. And in 1995, when the United States stopped the genocide against Muslim men and boys, it was a humanitarian mission. Now, at best, it would be a strategic move against the Russians. Right. So there's a great disappointment with the United States and a great worry that, depending on how politics goes in the United States, that Baji could be seen as a small Islamic country not worth defending. Right? And and that's that's the danger. And it's our Islamophobia that's really that, you know, it 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 creates a danger. So the strategy of the United States basically is get the let let the EU take care of it. Right? Let the EU and they're pushing, they got candidate status and I think October, November. So hopefully they will be moved into the EU, but they're in a very precarious position because, you know, you got three groups. Um, and one of them is, is actively trying to dismember the entire country. And um, it's doing a fairly good job of it. Yeah. You know? uh, and so what's going to take is, con is going to take uh, constitutional reform in order to reform. They have three presidents. They they rotate every eight months. <laughs> one Serb, one Croat. You know, it's just like I'm sorry, it just doesn't work, and it hasn't been touched. So, look forward to seeing a little bit of fire over there in the future. Um, and otherwise, I found it fascinating to be in an Islamic country. It was interesting to me. I mean, it's like, uh. I wish I could have learned more about it, but they're very guarded about not their religion, but they're very guarded that they, they don't want to kind of proselytize, right? They just don't want to do it. And that's incredibly refreshing, if you ask me. Um, and when I was there, so I was there six months. I had a great time uh, and I put on workshops and I taught at university. And um, then when I came home and turned in all my paperwork for my taxes and I said to my tax guy, 
I know I'm going to earn some money. And he said, well, I've done a little research. And he said, basically, what the money you got from Fulbright is not taxable. And I said, why not? And he said, because you didn't do any work. <laughs> <laughs> whereas the other eight poor people that went with me that didn't have doctorates and weren't scholars taught 12 hours a day at the local university English language they're being taxed because they had jobs but you know it's like that's what you say about a PhD piled higher and deeper you know? <laughs> uh, so I, I recommend it I recommend it and so what are your questions I have well First thing is, I, I know you, you mostly focusing on how things were there in the Bosnia Herzegovina. And if I remember 93, 94, 95, that period wasn't just Sarajevo. Sarajevo was, and, and the uh, neighboring places were definitely under siege, but something very similar to that started happening towards the later part of the war in, say, Pristina. And, yeah, near in Kosovo, area. even in Zenica. Yes, generally. That's the. Do you know the conditions in Kosovo, in that sense? I mean, I know Kosovo is again; it's got a lot of Albanians, so it's like a very heavily Muslim populated country. Is that exactly. very different from uh, how Bosnia and Herzegovina is like in terms of uh, for an average family? Um, I have not been to Kosovo, so I don't know. It's not really the same issues. I mean, they did get they get independence from Serbia. They are, you know, their own country now. Mm -hmm. um, Just a small yeah, under I'm, certain views. Huh? Certain people think they are country. Certain people don't. <laughs> Well, that's too bad because the United Nations says United they are. Guys, yeah. <laughs> so we're not going down that one again. <laughs> uh, no, I was taught a lesson on that. <laughs> I was talking to one person from Serbia, and uh, the question was very uh, simple. I just simply asked, like, how things are there in Kosovo, and I got an ear for it. Yeah, you it would. Was all about all those Albanians getting in there and then kind of trying to break up the country. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Serbia is its own, I mean, the history of the whole region is such that everybody has a grievance. Everybody thought, thinks they were the original people on earth. I mean, Serbs do. I, I, I'm not going to go down that route, but <laughs> there is this kind of Serbia, for greater Ser we are, what is the argument we have? Who are God's chosen people? Yeah, exactly. It's the Serbians, huh? It's, uh, you know, <laughs> clearly. Uh, it's like, who does God like best? Uh, and it depends on, and strangely enough, depending on who you talk to, is they, you know, always the same people. Uh, Serbs never say, oh, God likes Bosniaks better. Doesn't happen. Uh, but it is, I mean, they're, it is geography. I mean, these populations moved back and forth. They grew, you know, Bosniaks. It's just, and it's not really, it's not really easily divided up in ethnic groups, but that's what the Dayton Accords did. And they said, we're just going to power share. Bosnia itself, this tiny little country, is two parts. One part is the Bosniaks, which is the Muslims, and are connected, and it's the Federation. So it's the Bosniaks and the Croats together that are the Federation. Then there's Republic of Srpska, which is, you know, the, what the Serb populations are. But they're part of the country. But they're kind of part of the country and part of not kind of part. You know, it's like, it's... They're entities that act as independent entities and they block each other at every opportunity. Uh, and it's just unworkable. Where in the United States would we allow, you know, and not only that, but where in the world, where in the United States would we allow people not have to have a vote if you're not one of those three groups? Washington, D.C. Well, <laughs> uh, absolutely true. Political. It's true. It's true. Uh, Could I ask? Yeah. You had mentioned 
the paths, the different paths that yeah. they're on or could be on. What um what's your vision of best case scenario, worst case scenario, and the probabilities? And it's timed. You know, I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here's the best case scenario. Tito rises from the grave. <laughs> 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 and everybody bows down and we already got the full game plan that's the best game plan uh, what was the unity and uh, unity and they loved it. he was just oh, great yeah. he was yeah that was yeah that's what yeah it he did a great job the worst care case scenario is that within a couple of months fighting starts again republic of serbska detaches itself violently from the rest of bosnia and the international community is left to deal with it um which is a, an absolute possibility <laughs> huge piece of I mean, is that going to be part of Serbia? Would it attach to Serbia? Or the idea that's been floated this week by the head of the Dodic, who Mm -hmm. you know, as a Trump fan. Uh, but his idea is that he's going to detach Republic of Serbska, which is all the Serbs, right. uh, and you're going to attach them from Bosnia, and he's going to reattach them to Serbia. Serbia. Yeah. Okay. That's the plan. But he wants to take all the property with him. And, you know, that, so that's, that's the conflict now. And the question is whether the Europeans are going to let him do it or the, whether the Americans are going to let him do it, because, it, you know, it's nobody wants to go to war. And I can't imagine any of the people that I had coffee with during the day in Bosnia picking up a gun again. They've done that, been there, done that. That's okay. But it is a very tense situation. It's territory, you know. It's That's that the worst case scenario, is that That's the worst case scenario is the Bosnia ends up as an isolated little Islamic country. <laughs> On, on the only Islamic country in Europe on the edge. Uh, and that's a possibility. But it's it's kind of a dumb, I mean, Serbia is so poor. You know, all those countries are poor. They can't afford to be their own little entities. Serbia has no money. Uh, Croatia, and no money. they're immigrating as quickly as the Bosnians are. So they need to be working together. But, you know, it's it's they it just, it's their leaders, you know, and I say that about us. It's these leaders that they would just shut up. You know, they would quit pitting people against each other. You know, they'd be a lot better off. It's not just there. It's everywhere. You know, it's like wherever you go, there it is. Yeah. So uh, what's the best case scenario? The youngest is coming back to the country, rebuilding it? The best case scenario is what happened in Armenia. She had a kleptocracy. Then you had a reform movement. And then you had the diaspora going back. And then you had young people going back. And they put in the reformist government that's in Armenia that's, you know, that's doing so well right now. But that took the diaspora and the young people. As long as you're chasing your young people off, they're not going to make noise. And as long as your diaspora not organized, they're not, as long as they're making money too, right, you know, part of the corruption, they're not, they're not going to make but it's always the young people, and I also think the diaspora. But you can't have you can't have a country of three million people where fifty thousand of them leave every year, and forty thousand of them are kids, the most educated kids. Yeah, it's the educated ones, right? Green, green. What I think would be great, but the problem is that you don't have a good banking system because that's sort of messed up, is that if you had these international companies going in there, and like we were talking about the digital nomads, I mean, these people are so, these students are better than our students. They're more serious. Our students just have more opportunities and are, you know, more creative. Their students are extremely good, especially in IT. You know, if you had companies that were able, they didn't have to get on a bus and go to Germany. Somehow they could stay where they are. But the regulatory and the mismatch of banking and that stuff makes a situation where international companies don't want to go into a country where that's not a possibility. But I do believe in the future that might be the virtual working, whatever. So it's a great country. I loved it.
Any other if, questions? So these three groups, what's the relative size of them? Uh, Bosniaks for the country are like 49%. You might want to turn off recording of this. <laughs> well, if you want, I can quit. I can stop recording. <laughs> Mostly Muslims. Next largest group is Serbians. And the smallest group is Croatians. So how many are the what percentage of Croatians? Maybe 11 okay, at the so most. Quite small. Quite small. So but they have a disproportionate representation. Uh, nobody's happy. And right? they're more Catholic? Croatians are all Catholic. All Catholic. Serbs are all Orthodox. Orthodox. I think I said that That's wrong before. I, I said that wrong. No, I think yeah. you said it right. But I, I, I know Serbians are Orthodox, so I kind of left it. They might be the Catholic. You you said one of the three groups was was going to tear the region apart. Serbia. Yeah, the Serbs. There was something like forty percent annex. No, that's the Bosnia. Bosnia is the, the Bosnia is the large. Well, no, please, those numbers like the largest group is Bosnia, yeah. right? The and most and the second largest is and the second is Serbs, and the third is is Croatia. Croatia. But you got to realize that was greater, you know, the, the, all those areas were smashed together. These are art all artificial boundaries after the First and Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, you know, the ethnicity, but uh, yeah, so they're all smashed in there together. But Republic of Srpska was created in the Dayton Agreements. And that what that did was made just specifically Serbian populations. They're part of Bosnia, but they're independent. Yeah. How's that work? Uh, what, what was the other alternative at that point? Huh? What would have been the other alternative to make that part of the Serbia? I mean, it would have been, there wasn't any better alternative available in 95. Um, no, I think that's what they thought was the best solution yeah. is power sharing. I mean, that's how we do Iraq's map when we have to. Uh, yeah, look what happened there. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't turn out that well. It works. I mean, not. Is that how Pakistan uh, and India were done? Hindsight is not bad <laughs> <laughs> when you're drawing the map. Um, yeah, power, you know, it's, yeah, people don't want to share power. I mean, they really don't. And it's, uh, they have so many, and it's not like it's just the North Carolinians against the South Carolinians, right? Well, we don't really have any grievances. These are people who have some serious grievances. You know, these are people who are living beside the people that, that butchered their families. And it was incredibly vicious, incredibly vicious war. And they're, you know, and it's just it's very hard and it's what my boss said to me he said he's just he's a muslim he said i said it's got to be hard you know it's just got to be hard he said yeah he said you know we don't really you just you just always are vigilant you know and i thought oh yeah and so you know they live with this every year of you know, the higher ups manipulating the situation but, you know, it's like any middle class society, any middle class group of people is exactly the same whatever country they're in, right? They got the same needs to have family secure, have a job to be able to to feel good about it uh, and to provide for their family. And here in Bosnia, what you have is, um, I mean, I'm not trying to, it's a great country. I had a great time. But you have a country full of people who went through one of the worst genocides that we've ever recorded not that long ago they're still digging up these graves they're still identifying bodies at the same time the people who perpetrated a lot of these crimes are having streets named after them so there's this huge uh sort of disconnect between there has been no reconciliation except at the human individual level at the communities. And that to me was incredibly heartening is to see people work together and and not not divide, you know, not divide out. But you know, there's a human I would not say 
all people. But the first thing that the Bosnians will tell you when I say, well, that's weird. And they go, we all have post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, it's yeah, just an open you can, yeah. PTSD. Oh, oh. Post-traumatic yeah, stress disorder. Yeah, not have PTSD. Yeah. Otherwise, you're like a sociopath or something. I don't know. Right. And so it's, and, and not only did they, did they suffer during the war, I mean, these are people who are not professional soldiers or whatever they suffered, but then they came back and they didn't have any jobs. And they haven't had any jobs since where they've, you know, had to scramble. And that's 25 years of scrambling. And these are people are, you know, they really do deserve better. But because of where that country is and because of all the influences, in geopolitics around the world, they're just going to continue to struggle. They, so they really they, are. What is the saving grace? I mean, do they have uh, like a natural resources or the tourism or something? that can actually bring the country together? Uh, <clears throat> they don't have oil. <laughs> they don't, they have some minerals. No, in but the answer is basically no, they don't. They had their human human resource. I mean, there it's their human capital that's the most valuable, clearly, because they're it's very smart people. It's, all moving yeah. it's yeah. just it's sort of got there. the spigot on, right? Uh, but it's their human, the human capital that I think is their, uh, funny they're like southerners though i tell people i said you know bosnia is like the american south a small paranoid country <laughs> surrounded by enemies <laughs> i was thinking about that when you, you said that, that you know they're, they're living with the people who really they have real grievances with them and i think about a lot of our southerners how vehemently they're against certain other groups without Without nearly that much motivation, so, you know. Confederate money plays the South real right. <laughs> forget hell. That's you know, that could be a Bosnian. So forget hell. Don't you remember going down to the beach and you see those little shot glasses at all the tink the stores? You'd stop going down to Myrtle Beach and they all had shot gas glasses and mugs that said forget hell. There's like. Forget hell, forget, forget comma oh. hell, and then it would be like a little Confederate soldier with a flag. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's so much for Christian forgiveness, right? Nah, yeah. uh, <laughs> not. But there's so much intermarriage there. There really is. It's a huge oh, amount really? of intermarriage. Is that something new? Yeah. No, it's, it's not, and that's what makes them so upset. Because during Tito's time, you didn't have any of this stuff. There was a lot of intermarriage. There was no, there was not the oh, ethnic friction that comes out of the, you know, World War One and World War Two. Tito was really good at, at keeping the country together, and then when it fell apart, it just fell apart. Completely. And he makes a great part of history. <laughs> part of these things that she catches her attention. <laughs> and they make good wine. They have some very good wine. So if you actually want to take a good trip, go down the coast of Croatia and Bosnia, and that little piece of Bosnia. They actually put a bridge so you don't have to pass yes. into <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> Bosnia, not this way. <laughs> yeah, you're Bosnia, not this way. Yeah, it's right over the 10, it's like 10 miles or something because you had to go in and out. And in. And beautiful, beautiful area. It really is. Yeah. So, thank you, Dr. Pierce. This sure. <laughs> what did I get out of it? Tito. 